Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome back. Today, we are going to focus in on topics 7.3, 9.1, and 9.2. So we're going to get the last couple of topics from top, uh, Unit 9, Global Change, and sort of attach that to our Unit 7 uh, conversation. Uh, and then remember that our enduring understanding is that human activities have physical, chemical, and biological consequences for the atmosphere. Uh, please, 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 please make sure you are doing and completing the follow-up reading that accompanies these notes. Remember, you can't put all your faith in me to tell you everything you know. Do that reading. All right. So uh, we've looked at this before, back in uh, previous units. Uh, the normal temperature profile of the atmosphere. We all know that down here in the troposphere where we live, right, we see a nice temperature decrease with altitude, right? And then in the stratosphere, we see an increase in latitude, mesosphere decrease in temperature with, uh, with altitude, etc. Okay, so as, but in the troposphere where we live, this is primarily where we're going to focus our attention, right? Uh, we are really looking at um, a general decrease with temperature with altitude. Now, there is something called a thermal inversion. And here in Walla Walla, or if you happen to live somewhere perhaps like Salt Lake City, right, you ought to be well familiar with this idea of a thermal inversion. And what happens with a thermal inversion is that uh, the air temperature gradient is altered, okay, due to a persistent cool layer of air that remains near the surface. Now, so if we have, let's say, some mountains, and then we have a valley, all right, now, uh, if we have really, like, still air, right, um, and then we get some radiational cooling at night, what happens is that cool air tends to sort of, uh, as it becomes more dense, it tends to sink and settle into these valleys, all right, uh, which can then seed sort of like this formation of fog or clouds. And basically what happens in this process is, we don't have a lot of wind, so the atmosphere is especially uh, stable, as they might say in the meteorolo meteorological world, right? That cool air settles in the valleys, and we actually have cold or cooler down low, and a little, sort of a layer of warmer air above. And if you've ever been uh, stuck down here in the fog in the wintertime, one of the things you can do is go up into the mountains, get above that fog, and you often will see warmer and these bright sunny days, even when it's maybe 27 degrees down here in the Walla Walla Valley. All right. So in a temperature inversion, what we see is with altitude, rather than this sort of steady decrease, we would expect to see, right, over time with temperature, right, we get a sort of steady decrease, and then we have an inversion layer in which the temperature begins to increase again with altitude, right? So this inversion layer is where we kind of uh, invert, if you will, our normal temperature profile, which again, if we were to go from the surface and up through the troposphere, we would expect our temperature profile to just gradually decrease with altitude. But we do sometimes, and again, this is when we get very little air movement, so especially stable conditions in the atmosphere. The colder air can pool in our valleys, right? And the inversion layer occurs just above that where we get a uh, gradual increase in temperature with altitude uh, and so on, okay? Now, why is this coming up in this particular part of the year? And the reason has to do with uh, because we are talking about specifically um, uh, air pollution, right? These inversions, which are a natural phenomenon, so the inversion itself is not linked to anthropogenic activities. This just has to do with atmospheric conditions in certain parts of the, the world that are prone to these atmospheric conditions. Now, the reason, though, that we are concerned with this is because we have this air uh, in our valleys that just basically stays there. Right, so there's no uh, very little movement of that air. Uh, what we get is uh, air, what they call air stagnation, which allows for the buildup of pollutants over time. So often when we get these, those 
extended periods of really dense fog, uh, what happens is through vehicle exhaust and uh, other combustion or industrial processes, those pollutants that would normally go out into the air and then kind of get sort of mixed and diluted out in the atmosphere uh, build up to higher concentrations than under normal conditions. And so it can create really harmful conditions uh, for people with asthma and so on. Sort of similar to when we have wildfires. All right. So what you need to remember about thermal inversion is that it's a uh, naturally occurring phenomenon where we have very stable conditions of the atmosphere, so very little wind, very little movement of the air, right? That allows for cooler air to pool in our valleys, right? We get an inversion layer where our temperature profile reverses by increasing temperature with altitude. And the reason we're including that in our top unit seven is it is also associated with uh, a much higher buildup of airborne pollutants than we would normally experience. All right, now let's move over to ozone. We've talked about ozone several times before. So ozone, by the way, if you don't recognize it, so oxygen gas, right? The type that we want to breathe has a formula of O2. Ozone has a formula of O3, right? So instead of two oxygen atoms bonded together, it is three oxygen atoms bonded together. Now, we talked about in the last lecture that Ozone is good up high, but bad nearby. So again, uh, if we look at the uh, concentration of ozone, right, throughout our atmosphere, right, we have what's called the stratospheric ozone, right? This is the good type, right, that blocks harmful radiation. But we do have what's called the bad type, which we call photochemical ozone down here. It is associated with uh, harmful uh, impacts on breathing and damage plants and things like that. Okay, so remember, stratospheric ozone, essential and good. Ozone is good up high, bad nearby. Now, uh, so specifically, what does uh, ozone do for us? Well, it blocks certain types of ultraviolet radiation. Now, it blocks all of ultraviolet C. And thank goodness, because ultraviolet C is highly energetic and would really, really cause damage to living systems, right? It blocks most of our UVB and some UVA. Now, this is our most dangerous type. This would be our least dangerous type. But all three are energetic enough to uh, cause damage to uh, your skin and skin cells, right? So even though that stratospheric ozone filters out pretty much all of the especially harmful types of ultraviolet radiation, we do get some UVA and UVB that does make its way through, but much less than would without the presence of ozone in the stratosphere, right? So oxygen and ozone absorb pretty much all UVC, thank goodness. Ozone blocks most ultraviolet B, right? Uh, but UVA, just some is blocked, so it's really important to wear sunscreen. In fact, you'll see on your sunscreen bottles that it often says UVA and UVB protection, in case you're ever wondering what that meant. All right, so in the normal uh, stratospheric ozone, right, what we have are special conditions up in the stratosphere that cause it. So basically, it's a cycle like this. We have oxygen, gas, right, uh, and that basically gets split up into two uh, different oxygen atoms, we might call radicals, right? So by ultraviolet light. So that ultraviolet light that hasn't been filtered out, particularly type C, right, can hit something like an oxygen molecule, right? Split it up into single oxygens. Now, we have to remember that these single oxygens, right, are in the presence of lots of other uh, Molecules. So, for example, if we have a single oxygen here and a single oxygen there, right, that might be in the presence of O2, right? Those two combine to form ozone. Okay. Uh, so, basically, what we have is a this special types of conditions, namely the fact that we have ultraviolet type C, right? that is able to split our oxygen gas molecule into single oxygens, right? 
and those single oxygens, because they are mixed in with other oxygen gas molecules, sometimes form ozone, but they might recombine to form oxygen gas again, uh, and so on. Okay, so that's our normal stratospheric ozone cycle. Just because there's enough ultraviolet light up in the stratosphere to cause us, that can lead to uh, formation of ozone, and that's why we get a higher concentration of ozone up there in the stratosphere. All right. Now that's a very simplified version of what actually occurs. Now, um, if we insert compounds known as chlorofluorocarbons, those CFCs, right, are extremely stable and non-toxic molecules. So they were used as refrigerants, solvents, and propellants in aerosol cans, and were much safer than the original refrigerants like methyl chloride or ammonia or sulfur oxides. Because they are stable and non-toxic molecules, they were thought to be a very, very good option. Um, now, because CFCs are so stable, they are a gas, by the way, they remain in the atmosphere for decades and can eventually work their way up to the stratosphere. Um, and CFCs are less stable in the stratosphere and can sort of begin destroying the ozone formation that would normally occur. So, um, in the early 1970s, when we started using satellites to measure things, uh, uh, they began noticing that in both the Arctic and Antarctic regions, uh, there was considerable depletion in the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. And of course, this is concerning, and it was already beginning to do damage to some of the fragile ecosystems in those areas. Right? Uh, two chemists, Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina, right, uh, began to notice that um, CFCs might be the cause, and they published uh, research showing that the CFCs that have made their way up into the stratosphere were, in fact, the likely cause. Okay? And so basically the way it works is if we take a CFC molecule, all right, and it works its way up into the stratosphere where there is an abundance of ultraviolet radiation, what can happen is that ultraviolet radiation is energetic enough that it can sort of knock a free chlorine, often referred to as a Cl radical, off of that CFC molecule. So CFC stands for chloro, fluoro, carbon, right? And basically it would look like carbon with some chlorines and a fluorine, or maybe three fluorines, excuse me, and a chlorine or something like that, right? Depending on what type of compound it is. But basically, we get a chlorine radical that is released because ultraviolet radiation is energetic enough to basically break that bond. Now, that free chlorine radical can then attack an ozone molecule, all right, and peel off one of those oxygen atoms, right? So if we form chlor a chlorine oxide, right, and just oxygen gas. Now, oxygen gas is not as good at UV absorption. Okay, so what happens if we get enough of these CFCs up in the stratosphere, right, we can begin breaking apart our ozone into chlorine oxides and oxygen, and then we have a decreased ability, right, to uh, absorb ultraviolet radiation. Now, that is coupled with the fact that uh, we still have oxygen gas, right? That because of ultraviolet radiation forms single oxygens, right? Now, those normally would contribute to the formation of ozone again, right? So we could combine that with O2, for example, to form O3, right? But because we have these chlorine oxides out there, right, we have an increased likelihood that that single oxygen, right, combines with the oxygen from chlor uh, chlorine oxide to form oxygen gas again. And then we have that chlorine uh, atom or radical that is freed up again, right, to attack yet another ozone molecule, right? So a single uh, chlorine radical can destroy, you know, uh, you know, essentially thousands of ozone molecules because it just keeps going through the same cycle. Breaks apart ozone into oxygen gas and chloride oxide, 
the, the oxygen attached to the chlorine attaches to a free oxygen to form oxygen gas instead of that free oxygen forming ozone. All right, that chlorine radical is freed up again to go back and cycle back through. Now, uh, the actual chemical mechanism for all this stuff, I don't think it's going to be super important that you guys can describe it. What is important is that we know that CFCs, right, when in the stratosphere, can create chlorine radicals which can destroy ozone. And a single chlorine radical, because of the cycle, can destroy uh, thousands of ozone molecules. And as a result, as these build up in the stratosphere, right, they can reduce the amount of ozone in the stratosphere and therefore lead to ozone thinning and increased ultraviolet radiation, making its way down to the surface, damaging living tissues. All right. Now, uh, because of this uh, research done by Molina and Sherwood, those two chemists, right, in 1987, uh, the Montreal Protocol was introduced. Countries agreed, agreed to begin phasing ozone depleting chemicals out in favor of uh, alternatives. And current trends show that ozone could make a full recovery by 2050 if uh, the trends between 20, 2000 excuse me, and 2015 continue, all right? So this is one of those examples where uh, countries banded together and actually were able to get something done uh, and have positive impacts as a result. All right. Now, um, one last little bit to add here is we do have the bad kind of ozone. Remember, we talked about ozone is good up high, bad nearby. So if it's in the troposphere, right, ozone, uh, is a secondary air pollutant, right? Uh, and primary air pollutants such as volatile organic compounds, whoops, excuse me, such as uh, VOCs and nitrogen oxides uh, in the presence of sunlight can react to form ozone. Now remember, ozone down here is considered a pollutant. It uh, can cause uh, a respiratory irritation and damage uh, plants especially. All right, so I do want you guys to remember what causes ozone depletion in the stratosphere, right? And that's those CFCs, particularly those chlorine radicals, right? And I also want you to know the primary pollutants associated with the bad ozone down in the troposphere, which would be nitrogen oxides reacting with volatile organic compounds in the presence of sunlight.